Hello, guys. Welcome to Talk It Out. I'm Li Jingjing. There are many people and organizations across the world that are dedicated to ending the U.S. wars and sanctions and regime changing games. And today, I have two guests from one of those organizations. It's called Code Pink, a women-led grassroots organization based in the U.S. It was founded in 2002 to oppose the U.S. war on Iraq, and over these two decades, they've been continuously working to end the U.S.、Uh, wars and militarism. And recently, they had this、uh, campaign, which is to deliver a petition with 4,000 signatures to the headquarters of PBS, and asking them to stop censoring the documentary about China's poverty alleviation project. So today, I invited the co-founder of Code Pink and also the lead organizer of the event to have a discussion on the U.S. policies. So, hello, everybody. I'd like to introduce my guest today, Madison Tang. She is the coordinator for Code Pink. Uh, China is not our enemy, and also she is among the organizers for recent campaigns for Cold Pink. So, Madison, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Li Jingjing. Madia Benjamin, she is the co-founder of Cold Pink. So, hi, Madia. Thanks for coming to my show.、Hi. Thank you. Nice to be on with you. So, I will start by asking because you were among. Those ser- those several activists that s- deliver the signatures to PBS, asking them to stop censoring the documentary about China's poverty alleviation project. So I'm curious, why do you think this documentary is important for viewers in America? I live in the nation's capital in Washington D.C. Go. Well, just across the street from me is a guy sleeping on the、uh, outside of a、uh, a building, a school building. He comes every night and leaves during the day, comes back. Or I can go a few blocks away and see tents set up、uh, that are homeless people. Or I can go the other way under a bridge and see it lined up with people、uh, that have nowhere to live and have are just living on the street. And this is happening in cities all over the United States, and that's just the extremely、uh, unfortunate people who don't have housing. And then there are so many people who might have a roof over their head, but live in extreme poverty. And so I think it's important for us to do everything we can to learn how other countries are dealing with poverty. And when I saw that film、uh, on China. I was just astounded. I、uh, was amazed that so much effort by so many different layers of government, down to students in university, would be so involved in trying to lift so many people out of poverty in ways that are、uh, structural, so they won't fall back into poverty、uh, um, a few months later. Uh, so it is、um, very important for us to learn some of that. Now, I'm not saying that the U.S. could just take a program like that and transport it here. Very different societies、uh, and things that the American people would not be comfortable with. People coming into their house, for example, and asking them all about their income.、Uh, Americans are very individualistic like that. But I think there are other lessons to be learned about the tremendous laser-like focus of the、uh, Chinese system on lifting millions and millions of people out of poverty. I wonder why. <laughs> why do you guys care about this documentary so much? We feel it's important because、um, essentially the. Our petition and our letter, which got almost four thousand signatures,、um, that we tried to deliver to PBS headquarters in Virginia,、um, we feel that censoring the truth about China's poverty alleviation policies and 
censoring a rational view about positive aspects of China um, is depriving all of the viewers and the public in the United States of opportunities for learning about um, collective harmony and equality um, and insight into these policies, which have saved lives. And we know that the poverty alleviation in China has taken 800 million citizens out of extreme poverty. At the same time, um, poverty, food insecurity, and houselessness are at record levels in the United States as we're still dealing with a widespread um, pandemic. We haven't contained the pandemic. Um, and as we're dealing with the recession on top of that. So I'm just curious to you as uh, people in America, what would you say about the general Mar Americans view towards China, mostly positive or negative? Yeah, I think unfortunately, mostly negative in my experience and and I am um, biracial, so my father is Chinese American. Um, so I kind of have a different experience than like monoracial people, but I still experience some of that. Um, I think uh, one issue is that I feel that Americans in the US cannot separate criticisms of the country and government of China from the people. Um, and we see that in the simplest form and how they can't even separate Chinese Americans in diaspora from Chinese citizens or other East Asians um, and Southeast Asians who have also been victims of um, violence. But you're, you're very uh, smart and right to be talking about the like double standard kind of of the, the uh, portrayals of China and Chinese people. It's like on the one hand, they have this like Orientalist, xenophobic um, portrayal as like uh, mm. unclean, yeah, like uncivilized, um, despotic, um, diseased, all these things. And then yeah, on the so other they're hand, also being able to steal all American people's lunch and jobs and technology. <laughs> yeah, there's, they're also seen as so clever, so smart, and so deceptive that they can take over our whole country, apparently. They're the biggest threat to Americans and Congress members' grandchildren, which really does not align with reality. And China doesn't have, their foreign ministry do not have the goal of taking over other countries. They haven't intervened in another country in over 40 years. They just want to have economic power so that their people are taken care of um, and so that they can have solidarity with other countries against Western aggression. You are one of the co-founders of Code Pink, and when you got started this organization back in 2002, it was because you want to oppose U.S. wars on Iraq. And then over all these years, you guys also uh, been standing with, with people from Venezuela, Cuba, Iran, uh, against America's uh, sanctions and wars towards those countries. It's definitely not an easy job when the government is warmongering, like a lot of politicians is very warmongering. So what motivated you guys to continue to do this for, for such a long time? Well, I want to add to that, that we also oppose the US intervention in Afghanistan and all of these years, now 20 years, uh, we have been opposing that uh, military presence as well. And what keeps us going is that we have an opportunity to talk to people, sometimes in person, because we travel to countries like Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, uh, and we meet with the people who are victims of our interventions, or we talk to refugees who have had to flee those situations, people in Pakistan, for example whose families were killed by US drone strikes uh, that we met with and saw how their lives had been destroyed. And knowing that our government is so involved in military aggression and that this hurts us at home. Uh, when I see people unhoused in the United States, when I know that many of my friends don't even have health care, when I have uh, young friends who are students who have tens of thousands of dollars in debt, then I realize how much we are taking the money that should be going to these positive things 
and instead putting it into a war machine that just kills and maims and destroys. And I don't want my government to be representing me like that around the world. And the other people who are members of Code Pink feel the same way. We want to live in a world where we act, interact with each other in peaceful ways. We use diplomacy. You know, just like if your children are in school and start fighting with each other, you'll stop them and you'll say, no, that's not the way to resolve problems. I think on the global level, we feel like our country is a big bully uh, that is using its high tech and its wealth uh, to impose its will or try to, because obviously um, we don't win in these wars, uh, but tries to do that. And it reflects terribly on us as a people. And the last thing I want to say about that is that we also know that a lot of our policies are being dictated by companies that make these huge profits from war and death and destruction. And I live in Washington, DC. The suburbs of Washington, especially in Northern Virginia have become the richest suburbs in the entire country, more than the high tech areas of Silicon Valley or the Wall Street in, in New York City. Uh, they are um, the richest counties because of these military contracts. The military has so much money, billions and billions of dollars every year that go to these companies that make weapons and have uh, contracts with the Pentagon. And they're the ones who really get rich off of this. And that's not the way we want to see our tax dollars invested. But when the US military, when they went to another country, when they moved to invaded Afghanistan, they gave themselves, they gave themselves a very, uh, sounds righteous reasons. We we went there to, to, because it's a war on terror. Is we went there to build their nation to liberate their people. What do you make of that? Well, we think that that is always a justification for the aggression. Uh, after nine eleven, there was a lot of uh, public support for war because people were feeling they wanted to get back at those who attacked us. But the people in power really used the attack of September 11th, 20 years ago, to justify invading other countries, not just Afghanistan, but Iraq that have absolutely nothing to do with the 9-11 attack. And we also know that of the 19 hijackers involved in the 9-11 in the attacks, 15 of them were from Saudi Arabia but the US never wanted to invade Saudi Arabia. On the contrary, our government sells billions of dollars in weapons to Saudi Arabia that uses those weapons to kill and hurt people in neighboring Yemen. So we know that it really is uh, not true that the US goes in to liberate other people. The US goes in to try to take over nations, install US friendly governments, uh, use their resources, uh, but not to liberate people. If after 20 years in Afghanistan, you see that the people are among the poorest in the world, and you see that they don't even have decent infrastructure, we didn't even do that in 20 years. Majority of the people don't even have electricity. You can see that the US is not going there to help people. Speaking of Afghanistan, uh, it's on the headlines everywhere, and I think a lot of U.S. corporate media, one of the things they are talking about is like after U.S. Uh, military's withdrawal, what gonna happen to those Afghanistan? Uh, what gonna happen to all the girls and women there? When Taliban took control, it's gonna be a horrible time for all the women and girls, and the women issue becomes uh, uh, like a reason they they to glorify or justify their behaviors. So uh, Code Pink as a women-led grassroots organization, I think women's rights, women's situation are definitely a, 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 that a, a, a question that you guys care about. So, but like when corporate media in the US talking about so much about what a, what a terrible situation it will be for Afghanistan women, whereas the women in, in Saudi Arabia 
are basically experiencing a very similar situation, very same thing, yet they didn't say anything about the women in Saudi Arabia. So I'm wondering, what do you make of that? Yes, we saw 20 years ago how the issue of women became a justification for invading Afghanistan. And we believe that invasions and militarism are the very opposite of feminism, the opposite of liberation, that women have to fight for their own rights along with their male allies. But it is really up to women uh, to gain uh, uh, rights and equality in their societies, just like we in the United States still don't have equal rights, equal pay. We're still fighting for that uh, here at home. So uh, I think that uh, that um, it is a, a, a fantasy to think that uh, bombing and invading and occupying another country is good for women. Women have been the greatest victims along with their children of these wars. They've been killed in these wars. They lose their husbands, their fathers, their brothers. Uh, they make it harder for uh, women to feed their children. And yes, it's true that more women were able to go to school after the Taliban left, but the majority of women in Afghanistan continue to be illiterate. The majority of young girls have to drop out of school because of poverty. So uh, I, I think um, we don't, can't let our leaders try to use uh, women's rights, women's issues as a reason to go for war. We have to constantly be, be saying that war is against our values. Militarism is not the right way to solve conflicts and it's certainly not the right way to quote, liberate women. And I also want to ask about, because I saw this uh, campaign, uh, Coping's campaign about uh, for, for China, um, because in like recent years, we've seen this uh, escalating aggressions towards China from the uh, US government, and also the increasing information warfare, either by publishing uh, biased or uh, false information, or just like the documentary, uh, which see, seems like glorifying China's system or activity, they would directly just censor it, not broadcast it. And I also see, saw, saw you guys stepping up, speaking for China in many issues. So I'm wondering, um, since when uh, Cold Pink started to um, like stand up for, for China, if I can say that, if that's the right way to describe it, so, and is there any future campaigns in plan? Well, we have a campaign called China is not our enemy. So it's not really so much standing up for China. It's saying that we don't want to be in a conflict with China. We don't want to go to war with China. We want to have uh, friendly relations with China. And so if there are things that China does good, like uh, alleviating poverty internally, we think American people should have the right to know that. But most importantly for us is to stop our government's aggression against China. We already see the ramifications of that with the anti-Asian hate crimes that have gone up so much here in the United States uh, with the uh, blaming of China for coronavirus. Uh, and we also see it in the justification for our enormous military budget, which so uh, overshadows the amount of money that China spends on its military. But we are constantly being told that China is spending more money on its military. China has all these high-tech weapons. Uh, we have to invest more in order to compete with China. And uh, because Code Pink has as our fundamental uh, basis that we want to free up this money that we spend on the Pentagon and instead put it into things like healthcare and dealing with the climate crisis. As long as our government is able to convince people that China is this enemy, uh, then they will continue to be able to rob us uh, by putting so much of the money that's needed for other things into 
uh, militarism, high-tech weapons, drone warfare, artificial intelligence, all of these things that we're told are necessary to compete with China. So that's why our campaign is called China is not our enemy. And we think it's so important to educate people about the uh, relationship between the US and China and to convince them that we have to work together with China, cooperate to solve the globe's biggest problems together like the climate crisis instead of this uh, militarized competition. How difficult is this campaign compared to other, your other campaigns? Yeah, I think um, this campaign does have, it is very difficult because there's part of the hybrid war that the US is waging on China involves an information war, information warfare. Um, so we're kind of fighting a very uh, curated like narrative that has so much power behind it. Um, like I said, it includes the Biden administration, Congress, um, the mainstream media, and then to an extent, even just some of the public because of a lack of understanding, a lack of familiarity with the East and with China and Chinese history and Chinese American history even. Mm -hmm. There's a hole in their knowledge um, related to Orientalism. So we're just trying to fight all of that information and dismantle it um, and show where there's extreme bias, anti-China bias, um, mm -hmm. to the extent that it's harming people, whether that be in the South China Sea or in the US through anti-Asian violence, it is harming people directly right now and it will get worse. Um, so it has been difficult, um, but I think slowly we're kind of making US citizens aware and Westerners generally, I think of what is happening because a lot of our military buildup around China and a lot of the um, legislation in Congress right now that is very like, anti-China uh, focused. All right, that's why we need you. We need you guys and your organizations to keep people informed with another side of the story. So thank you so much, Madison. Thank you, Madia. Thanks for being on my show.